couple of quick words just before we dive in today. First of all, a mistake made last week in my message has been corrected on the YouTube version of that message. Thank you to our resident historian, Old Testament historian, Mark Elwell, for pointing out to me kindly afterwards that I jammed two events that were 110 years apart together and made it sound like that the Assyrian invasion of the Northern tribes were the same thing as the Babylonian exile. Oops. <clears throat> so that's been corrected. Thank you for that. We elders do that from time to time because as I'm sure this comes as a great shock to many of you, sometimes I make a mistake. Even in my message, I know, I, I know it's hard to believe, but it happens. So Mark, thank you for that. And a shout out to James Pipe for correcting a couple of spelling errors a couple of weeks ago on some slides because I had started my spell check halfway through the presentation and didn't go back up to the beginning and catch some that I had made late in the editing process. These things are very appreciated. Now I know it's hard to take feedback sometimes, but we wanna get it right. And so 50 extra living water points for each slide, James, that's a total of 100 living water points to you, buddy. Good job on that one. It takes a village to raise a pastor or something like that. Anyway, and I wanted to point out something else that I've been enjoying and that is our growth encounter. Uh, I'm gonna see if I can put myself on enough. There, can you see that okay? This is an olive wood carving, a little statuette that I got from my parents who had been to Israel years before Joy and I were able to go. And it shows a shepherd with a sheep around its shoulders, probably that one shepherd who was so good that he left the 99 to go out in search of the one. And I've been enjoying so much this growth encounter at 930 a.m. every Sunday that I just wanted to give one more strong plug to let you know you're missing out if you're not getting in that growth encounter. It's worth the extra hour of your Sunday morning and we're diving deep into some good lessons. We've been hearing about some lessons from Phil Keller's book about sheep and what we can learn from them, especially as it shows up in the shepherding style of King David later on. So if you haven't made it yet, please, I invite you, I implore you, to show up at 9.30 a.m. on Sunday for that growth encounter, I think you will be very glad that you did. Also, one final word, and that is that all of us, our hearts are with the Elwell family this weekend and going through this week. Uh, some of the Elwells are out in Utah right now for the memorial service for a sweet niece, Charity, who passed away, unfortunately, a victim of COVID. And so we are lifting up the Elwell family. And for those of you Elwells who may be tuned in, we're with you. And uh, we ache with you and we're praying for you today. Now, I had put out a little something just a few days ago uh, on our closed group Facebook page. And I also did something and opened it up widely, put it on my personal page so that people all around the nation uh, could be in on that. And I had no idea we would get so many words coming in. This represents a fairly significant cross-section of the words that came in, but that was such a lengthy list that came through all that, that I think it was Stephanie who said, so how long is the intro going to be based on this? And I said, well, we'll probably get lunch about three o'clock today. <laughs> so I've condensed as many as I could into this one sing single slide for you to see that these are many of the words. And I've chosen mostly the positive ones. We had a few others that were pretty realistic, like chaos and materialism, things like that, because that's true. But these were uh, a really good cross-section of the kind of tone that was set by the words that were being put forth in that question. And I, the question was simple. It is, what word or words, one or two words, would you use to describe Christmas? And this is what we got. So many good positive words about that. And it really is great to me to see how many of them pointed to the real meaning of Christmas, which I appreciate. But I would like to ask a question today in this message and from the two passages, gospel passages that we're gonna be studying. And that is, would you ever think that you would be using a word, a little different word to describe Christmas? This one in particular. 
disgrace. That's not the first one that comes to my mind as I think about Christmas. If somebody said, describe Christmas for me in one word, and I'd say, disgrace. They might think, what? I'm not sure what you're doing, but that's not the word that comes to my mind. But when we look into these passages, I think we can't help but include this word because it's a primary word. And we'll get to see why in a couple of minutes. So here we are, arriving at the third Sunday of Advent. Have yourself a disgraceful Christmas. The title of my message today, Luke 1 and also Matthew 1. We're going to look at two passages. One is the Annunciation of the Angel Gabriel to Joseph and another one to Mary. We're going to take Mary's first because we're going to see why it was important that the chronology factor in how Joseph responds to the There were some disgraceful things that have happened around Christmas. I saw a snippet of a movie that was playing in the background as I was coming through the living room uh, just two weeks ago, I think. And there was this little girl who had taken the baby out of the manger in front of the church. Disgraceful. People thought that was a scandal. They would think, how disgraceful is that? Who would do such a thing? Well, it turns out that she was afraid that the baby Jesus was going to get cold because <laughs> it was really cold outside where she was. And she had taken the baby home to get it a blanket. Oh. So everything turned out in the end. All is well. And then... I remember a couple of cousins that set a trip wire for Santa one year in the living room, trying to catch him in the act of delivering toys. Unfortunately, Santa must have been trained in some martial arts or trip wire detection tactics or something because he stepped over the wire and still got the toys delivered unbeknownst to the sleeping cousins. That may or may not have happened in my own immediate family. <laughs> And I remember a Christmas pageant at a church in which some very young shepherds got into the middle of a big ninja turtle fight with their staffs. <laughs> some people might have thought, oh, that's disgraceful. But most of the people I spoke with after the show thought that they were actually the highlight. But first, a word lesson as we go into something that we can see is disgraceful about the real, actual first Christmas. A word lesson. Now, if you spell the word enunciation with an E, if your teacher asks you to enunciate more clearly, what does she or he mean? Well, it comes from the Latin word, that one which you can see there. And the early definition is to speak out. From the 1750s on, it came to mean more specifically to articulate your words more clearly, which means that if you're mumbling a little bit, and if the teacher says, you need to enunciate, what will you do? You will articulate words clearly if you're taking the definition of the, 19, seven, or the 1750s onward. However, if you were to spell the word differently with an A in, in annunciation instead of enunciation, it's also from the Latin, but you can see that same A in, in at the beginning, same basic root word means something similar but slightly different because the earliest definition of annunciation is the announcement of Christ's birth, the incarnation. So if somebody were to say, enunciate for us, and if they pronounced it so that you weren't sure if they were saying E or A at the beginning of their word, if you're in class, students, I'm here to tell you, probably you shouldn't stand up and say, fear not, Mary, for behold, I'm here to bring you good tidings. You will give birth to the Son of God. Don't say that in class. It won't go well for you, unless you're studying about this specific event, in which case your teacher may have used the ANN version. She probably meant speak more clearly. But in this case, we're studying about the annunciation instead of the enunciation, because the earliest definition of here is especially applicable. From the 1560s onward, this particular word use, annunciation, means an announcement just in general. So if you were to say, Kroger is having a sale. Well, that's an annunciation. Doesn't have the same meaning. We're going all the way back to what was uh, really the annunciation of the angel Gabriel to two different individuals, first to Mary and then to Joseph, which means that first we're going to Luke and then we're going to Matthew and those two gospels today. Are you with me? If so, say, I'm with you. I'm with you. Thank you. Good job. So first, Gabriel speaks to Mary. I'm going to read this for us together. Listen carefully. 
and use your imagination and put yourself in Mary's shoes. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she, who was said to be unable to conceive, is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to, be, to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of this word. And may I point out briefly and parenthetically that we see the Trinity represented in Gabriel's words to Mary, because we see that as he's telling her how this is going to happen, he says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, that's God the Spirit, the power of the Most High, that's God the Father, will overshadow you, and then the Holy One to be born, that's the Son of God. We see all three of the persons of the Holy Trinity represented, even in one announcement, which is great. Even though the word Trinity doesn't appear in Scripture, the concept is definitely there. End of parenthetical note. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were Mary, and if you were trying to place yourself in Mary's shoes there, listening to Gabriel's pronouncement, his annunciation to you, would you have immediately accepted what he said? Would you have been able to dive right in and say, cool, Gabe, I'm in. Count me in, I'm, I'm there. I will do whatever needs to be done. Or would you be a bit mind boggled? And would you be starting to think, whoa, wait a minute. I'm a virgin. I'm not consummated in my marriage yet. I'm still betrothed. So even though we're legally united, we haven't actually become man and wife in the full sense of the word yet. How is this going to be? Which is precisely what she was asking. It wasn't skepticism in the way that she was saying, uh -uh, this ain't going to happen. What's going on? It was simply asking, okay, how is this going to be accomplished specifically, which is why Gabriel gave her the answer that he did. He told her exactly, this is how this will be accomplished. It's going to be the zeal of the Lord that will accomplish this for you. So Mary says, and this is to her credit, which is probably why she was chosen. Let everything you have said happen to me. Amazing thing when you consider what she's being told by this angel. Now, what about Joseph? You'll notice some different colors in the words here. I've done that on purpose, and I'll explain them. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but, and I italicize this, before they came together, you know what that means. I don't have to go into detail there. Before they came together, she was found bright yellow, bold, italicized. She was found, discovered. It came to be known to be, red flag word here, pregnant through the Holy Spirit. And I shrank the words through the Holy Spirit so small. Why did I do that? Because there's this thing called red flag words that come into all of our listening abilities. Have you been uh, hit with a red flag word recently? Has somebody been in a conversation with you, either virtually or in person, and they spoken something that was a red flag word, and all of a sudden your mind went to something so interruptible that you couldn't think past that word? 
like happens when I was teaching in the uh, book of 1 Corinthians, for example. It was difficult to address certain passages because Paul was telling us something that was a really Christ-like thing to do when he was saying, we need to build relational bridges. I want to be all things to all people so that some may be saved. But we never got to that so that part because we hit red flag words when we're sharing that kind of good news, bad news gospel. And when we're talking about the reconciliation of people, lost sinners who need to be reconciled with a holy God, it's easy for us to say, we need to be like Christ. We need to hang out with sinners. But when we start getting specific about what kinds of sinners, and if we start naming which kinds of people we're supposed to relate with and build a bridge, all of a sudden, sometimes there can be a red flag word and people stop listening. And we don't get to the, so that we can have a clear hearing and earn the opportunity to share the gospel so that they saved because it's in their salvation that Christ can change their heart and then he will be the one to clean up their act but we're not asking them to clean up their act first it doesn't work that way God meets us where we are so that's what I was trying to share in one of my messages recently and it so concerned me that I didn't get much sleep the night before I preached one specific message because I knew I was going to be talking about some specifics and they were going to be red flag words for some people who would hear them did that ever happen to Jesus, do you think? <laughs> do you know anything at all about the Pharisees and the Sadducees? If you read the New Testament, you'll know that we are red flag word people, even Christian people, even people who think we're really doing something for God. We can hear a red flag word and suddenly our mind stops. And instead of listening to the whole passage and thinking, okay, what is it in context that he's telling me that we need to do here? We write them off. It happened to Jesus. A lot of people fled and left when he started getting to the tough stuff. And yet, we need to become all things to all people so that some may be saved. Well, I think there were some red flag words even in what happened with Joseph here. If I were to get to that part where the angel is talking to me, if I'm Joseph, and he says, uh, okay, yeah, Mary was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. If, if, there, if she's found to be pregnant, now, this, I'm sorry, this was not Gabriel speaking. This is the discovery of all that. If I'm discovering, how, are, how am I discovering? They didn't have a drugstore nearby where she could go and get a pregnancy test. And she's not sitting in her cottage looking at it and saying, hey, Joseph, guess what? It's not how it happens. Probably there's a baby bump. I don't know. There may be some other kinds of evidence, but she was found to be pregnant. And all of a sudden, if she's trying to share this with Joseph, Let's just kind of use our imaginations a little bit. I'm trying to place myself in this situation. And if she says, but it's through the Holy Spirit, Joseph, so it's going to be okay. If you're Joseph, are you going to be hearing that? You know, I, I probably wouldn't. I don't know how Joseph responded specifically. I'm just trying to place myself in the situation. I probably would stop listening at <laughs> pregnant instead of saying, yeah, through the Holy Spirit. And even if, if I had heard that, this is an unprecedented event. Nobody in history, <laughs> nobody has been in this situation before. So I might be thinking, okay, all righty. Yep, this is not adding up. Something is not computing, Mary. What do you mean through the Holy Spirit? I think you need some help, honey. We need to get you to the psych ward or whatever. It was disgraceful. For Joseph to discover this thing, all of a sudden, this word disgrace comes into play, and I mean big time in Joseph's life. He's got to be sorting through a lot of different feelings, and he's trying to place himself in the situation and thinking, oh, my goodness, we haven't come together yet. What does this mean to me? Well, wait a minute. What does it mean to Mary? Has she been with another man? That may have been one of the thoughts. It's certainly going to be one of the thoughts to the people in the village once they start to make the connection here, because that's how babies are born. And if it wasn't me, if I'm not the father, then, oh, man, this is disgraceful. Now, wouldn't it have been nice? Wouldn't it have been nice for Joseph if Gabe had just shown up a couple of days earlier and said, Joseph, you're not, buddy. I'm here for a little heads up. You're going to get some news, and it's going to be kind of tumultuous, and it's going to shake you up a little bit, but I'm here to prepare you for that news, okay? So deep breath in, exhale slowly. You're going to find out. Keep breathing, buddy. 
the one who, who you're betrothed to, Mary, this one who's going to be your wife, she's going to become, another deep breath in, pregnant. It's okay, buddy. Keep breathing. It's going to be all right because it's going to be from the Holy Spirit, okay? So I know it's going to be all right. Wouldn't it have been great if Gabe had done that? Didn't do it. Timing was just not the optimal <laughs> for Joseph. But Joseph's response, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law. I put that in bold and in yellow because that's important as well. Faithful to the law. And yet he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. All right. We see something about his character as well. You can say, okay, Mary said yes to what Gabriel is saying she's going to be doing for God. Joseph has in mind to spare Mary. Spare her what? Well, public disgrace is what it's pointing to right here in Matthew 119. But there's a little more to this that makes it even more significant why Joseph chose to do that. If he were faithful to the Jewish law, we kind of need to look back to see what the Jewish law was. And that's where it gets really heavy duty. If he, were, if he were thinking, as I would be thinking, I don't think this is supernaturally conceived. She's pregnant. I've never dealt with this before, but it's got to be somebody else. All that was a PG event. It was pre-Gabriel when he discovered that. So we need to make sure that we don't hurry too quickly through verses 18 and 19, because all that factors into why he was thinking, I might just need to divorce her quietly. Because that means I've got to undergo the shame and disgrace for my entire village, but more than that, and this is where it gets tricky, more than that, because he was faithful to the law, he knew something that went all the way back to Deuteronomy and the thing that they would have still been under that Jewish law back then. What is the Jewish law? Deuteronomy 22, 23 through 20, 24. If somebody who is betrothed to be married, that's as good as married because it's a contract, can only be broken through divorce, even if they haven't consummated the marriage yet. And if that woman has found out to be unfaithful, to the one she's betrothed to. And if there's no evidence that she can prove she's still a virgin, that gets a little messy and kind of embarrassing, but that was the law back then. Then both she and the person she had lain with could be taken out and stoned to death publicly. She, because she didn't cry out and say help, and he, because he had taken another man's wife. That's what the law stated. Wow. I mean to tell you, this was a big deal. So for Joseph to say, I'm going to spare her public disgrace actually could have meant, I am going to spare Mary's life. Wow. Let that soak in for just a minute. It means that he is going to probably be taking on an awful lot of the disgrace upon himself, and he's trying desperately to figure out what's the best thing that I can do because I love this person, even though I think what she has done may be completely nuts. <laughs> it may be crazy. And I'm saying I'm putting a lot of myself into this. I don't know if Joseph, Joseph thought those things, but if I were him, this is what I'd be thinking. But he covered Mary's disgrace with his grace. That's kind of a foreshadowing of what happens in this whole Christmas story. And it's something that I think we need to let sink in. This was a huge, tumultuous event. So we can't just come sliding through those two verses in the pre-Gabriel announcement stuff as Joseph is wrestling with this. I don't know how long it was. I don't know how long he stewed over it. If it had been me, I would not have been getting any sleep until Gabe finally showed up. And aren't we glad that Gabe showed up? And that's where we see the turning point. And that's why disgrace is such a key part of the Christmas story. I would go so far as to say you can't accurately describe Christmas in its full meaning without using the word disgrace. I think it's vital. But then, this is where we get that wonderful turning point. The turning point is in verse 20. After the disgraceful discovery, however that happened, after the decision to divorce quietly had been made, in Gabriel's mind for noble reasons. After weighing what this could mean to Mary, 
including perhaps being stoned to death if they were still living by that Jewish law, and I assume they would have been. Then there's the turning point. Everything shifts from Mary's incredible disgrace, which would also fall onto Joseph, to God's incredible grace. This is where we need to have the word disgrace included in the Christmas message, because without that, we can't understand God's grace significantly. Okay, for Joseph, what does that mean? It means that even if he chooses to divorce Mary quietly, he is willing to embrace his own version of disgrace. Whatever happens to Joseph, however he handles it, he's going to be disgraced. He's going to be a target for shame coming at him from all sides in that tiny village. What does it mean for us? This is something where I think we start to see the gospel peeking through. It means that God doesn't desire to leave us in our disgraceful moment. Man, that's good news. I've been in several disgraceful moments, many of them caused by myself, some because somebody that I was close to disgraced themselves and there was sort of a guilt by association. Whether it's caused by ourselves, or whether it's caused by others. God doesn't want to leave us there in that shame and disgrace. Our typical reaction to shame, oh man, God wouldn't want to have anything to do with me. <laughs> I've done something so terrible that he couldn't possibly want to have anything to do with me, so I need to get away from there. I need to hide. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. What do they do when sin entered? They hid, or at least tried to. You can't hide from God. I need to escape these feelings of shame. That's a big motivating factor. I remember being a kid when I did something wrong, and I just wanted to escape the feeling of shame. And so I tried to keep myself distanced from my parents. I didn't want to get around them. And I knew that I was a terrible liar, and that if I looked at them in the eyes, mom would know, because moms know these things. And she would see that something was not right, or she may have already known it. And she was just waiting for me to fess up. You know, moms, what, can, what that could be like. But you want to escape those feelings of shame. And so you dive deeply into this black hole of escape, whatever escapism looks like for you. I can't show my face because they'll judge me. So what does that do to us? It drives us away from the very people or the very person, God, who can help me escape my shame and get reconciled, and get back into a right relationship again. And so we distance ourselves. It's a human reaction, and it's so typical, <laughs> but it happens. And it was probably going to happen with Joseph. I can imagine it may have happened somewhere down the road, because these things take time to play out. It doesn't happen instantly. Weeks or months later, after all this took place, if Gabriel had not shown up, if things had played out differently, People would have played all this out the way we do. Other people would have taken sides. Some people might have sided with Mary. Some may have sided with Joseph. There could have been a split in the little Jewish synagogue back then. Hey, there were human beings. Things happen like that. It's been happening ever since then. They're human. They're just like us. That's why this story is so important to us, because it applies to us, and we need to know that God's grace covers our shame. God shows up. When God shows up, he breaks the power of shame. He destroys it. Long lay the world in sin and error, pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. That's why we need to immerse ourselves in God's word and understand what he thinks about us. Not what we're afraid other people will think about us, but what does God think about me? We're just pining for God and what he can do for us until he finally shows up so that I can feel what my real value is and where it comes from. It's not how I'm perceived by others. It's what God thinks of me. And that's what he did for Joseph. Jesus came to earth because we were in disgrace. People were sinful and lost in their sin. They were dead in their sin. That's why Jesus came. That's why he had to come. Nobody else in history could have dealt with sin other than Jesus. It's because sinners need somebody to break that power of shame and disgrace. That's why he came. 
The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, says the psalmist, and saves those who are crushed in spirit. He does so precisely because they are crushed. That's when we finally we become aware that we cannot handle our sin and our shame and our disgrace on our own. We have to have a savior. None of us can break the power of shame on our own and in our own strength. We can't do it. It's impossible. That's why we need God. So here's a lesson from Joseph. We can be completely confident of God's opinion of us. We can be absolutely confident in that. Gabriel told Joseph, don't be afraid. Good thing, isn't it? That he's saying, don't be afraid. What's he telling him not to be afraid of? Well, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. What are the implications? That double shame he was going to experience. His own situation, feeling ashamed because he's related to this person who's gone through that, but also feeling ashamed because of all those other people's judgment knowing that wherever he went people would be judging him and thinking poorly of him thinking shame shame on you how could you possibly have done such a thing or how could you still try to protect mary when she's done such a heinous thing depending on which version of the story gets out and how they embrace it what must joseph have been thinking try to put ourselves in his situation and we start to understand why it was so important that Gabriel says, don't be afraid to take Mary home with you as your wife. Bringing that back to us and what this lesson does for us today, it's good to know what God thinks of us. When we've lived with shame, it's good to remember that neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord, comes from the Apostle Paul in Romans. Nothing can separate us. Don't be afraid. Fear not. Move forward in your life, even if there's shame that you've been trying to hide from. That's what we get from this. God turns our trial into our testimony. That's another thing we see from Joseph. Gabriel tells Joseph that Mary's son, Jesus, will save his people from their sins. His trial became the greatest testimony in history. And on a much smaller scale, our trials can be transformed into our testimony as well. Here's the difference between shame and God. Shame lies to us, tries to tell us that we're nothing, that we have no value whatsoever and that we'll have to fall into the black hole of shame and escape those feelings, and so we have to distance ourselves from God. God, in in fact, tells us the truth. Sometimes it's a two-pronged truth. The first truth is, yes, you have sinned if sin is involved. In this case, it was not Mary who sinned. I'm saying that this is what happens often because of sin in our, our lives. God will say, yes, you have sinned. That is the truth. But there's another part of that truth that he's going to share. This is that bad news, good news of the gospel. The good news is my grace will cover that sin. You don't have to stay in your disgrace because of my grace. I am now absolving you of guilt, and I'm going to lift you out of that black hole of shame. And you can walk secure in me. That's what God does when he tells the truth. Shame says You'll never escape disgrace. You're going to walk with this for the rest of your life. What you've done is so bad that nobody could possibly forgive you, not even God. And that's a lie. It's just flat out a lie. God says he will redeem our shameful moments. God shows us even through this wonderful incarnation story, the true events of Joseph and Mary and Gabriel that he came precisely so that he could redeem our shameful moments and lift us out of that shame. For example, I ran across a really neat story just this last week, and I'd like to share it with you. It's a true story about something that happened to show how God can actually transform our trial into a testimony. He can turn our mess into his message. This came from Micah Campbell. She wrote this. She said, for 20 years, my brother was absent from our family because of drug addiction. Countless times, we thought he was dead. 
according to the drug abuse statistics that we were familiar with, he probably should have been. However, my brother is living proof that God is, the restora is, is in the restoration business. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, or what has been done to you. God is willing and able to turn any tragedy into triumph. After entering many drug treatment programs with hopes of success and end results of failure, my brother finally found the answer, Jesus. It wasn't until he met the Lord that he experienced lasting healing and life change that was permanent. Suddenly, all things became new, as has been promised in the New Testament. My brother didn't have the strength, the willpower, or the ability to free himself from bondage. And boy, was he ever in bondage. But that changed when he surrendered his life to Christ. The same is true for us. No matter what the bondage is, drug, lust, gluttony, pride, anger, fear, until we renounce our sickness and, our, and finally surrender ourselves to Christ, we will never experience freedom. On the other hand, when we're willing to give King Jesus our mess, he turns it into our message. And that's exactly what happened to my brother. Not a day goes by that my brother doesn't look for an opportunity to brag on God and share his message of hope. Such an opportunity arose one evening when my sister, my brother, and I met together for dinner at a local restaurant. This is pre-COVID, by the way, when restaurants were still open. Our server was 26-year-old Tiffany. Right away, we noticed two things about Tiffany. Number one, she had the gift of gab. She had this wonderful innate ability to put people at ease. And number two, she was very pregnant. I mean, really pregnant. <laughs> and while we enjoyed her kind service, we had no idea that God would soon call us to serve Tiffany. It started when my sister refused to allow my brother to pay for her dinner. <laughs> While my sister loves to give to others, she's not very good at receiving. And so they got into this check fight with Tiffany, the server, caught in the middle as my brother was trying to say, no, no, I, I want to pick it up it's because I really care about you. Let me do that. She said, I knew my brother and I knew what he had been through. And I knew that he felt badly for all the times that he had put our family through lots of grief and that I didn't want to rob him of a blessing of being able to bless us. But my sister was really adamant and was not going to let my brother pay the tab. So finally, my brother, who noticed that Tiffany was very uncomfortable in the middle of this check fight, decided to put her at ease. And so he says, you see, I was a drug addict for years. And during that time, my sisters did an awful lot for me. And now I just want to turn around and bless them. And Tiffany's eyes widened. She said, you were a drug addict? I never would have guessed that. He said, oh, yeah. <laughs> I was, I was in deep, but Jesus changed all that. And then he told Tiffany his life-changing story. He said, I went from being lost to being found, from being homeless to being a homeowner, from being an employee to owning my own business, from being bound by drugs to being set free in Christ. And tears filled Tiffany's eyes as we shared God's love with her. That's not all. Later that week, we confirmed God's love to her by presenting her with a gift for her baby. When you and I, like my brother, says Micah Campbell, when you and I allow God to turn our mess in, into our message, he not only changes our lives, but he can change the lives of other people too. I found that to be really true. And I'm so grateful that Jesus came precisely to lift us out of our guilt and shame, to forgive us of our sins, and to put us on the right road so that even our mess can become his message of hope for other people. Because it's the message of the gospel. Jesus came because the world was pining for a savior. You and I need a savior. We can't save ourselves. And the instrument of suffering and shame became the symbol of grace and redemption for him. That's why the cross is such a beloved and treasured thing for Christians. It was because that symbol of suffering and shame shows us exactly how much God was willing to die in our place. 
So let him take your shame away. For those of us who have trusted Christ, have allowed him to forgive us of our sins, oh, redemption is a wonderful thing. It's like a weight lifted from our shoulders. We still mess up though, don't we? Even well-meaning Christians mess up. And we need to let God take away our shame, and he will. And if you're not somebody who has embraced this term Christianity yet, you, you wouldn't call yourself a Christian. If you're listening to this, I want you to know that same wonderful grace is available to you. And God loves you so much. He loves you so much that even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That includes you. And he would love to take away your sin and your guilt and to wash you clean through the blood of his savior, his son, Jesus Christ. That's why he came. So we have to use the word disgrace in describing Christmas because of God's grace. Let's let him take your shame away. I'm going to say a brief prayer, and then I'm going to ask Steve a song that will allow you time to just talk with God silently about him reaching in, and I want you to let, allow him to take away that shame that you might have. Let's pray together. God, in this moment of quiet and through the song, I pray that people will allow you to reach deep down to wherever that shame may be, may be in their lives. I don't know what that shame may be caused by or where it came from, but I know you're big enough and compassionate enough to take it away. I pray that you'll do that. And I thank you for your forgiveness, which is available to us clearly and unmistakably through your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for sending him because we need a savior. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen.